scene is um so <laughs> Dude, you're such a <laughs> well the thing is i'm not always sure how people will react to a camera and, and one thing i was going to say was if in the room in, when sam comes in if he if it gets to a situation that he he's insulted by me holding the camera he doesn't know that you're coming with a i camera. told i called told jim mm -hmm. if randy says it's okay i'm going to bring the camera in and because i want to just sort of document the event you know, it, it's a transition. And what you're saying right now is that this transition is going to have a major effect on the museum. I believe it will have a huge effect because when I first came on board, I actually had more support and that made a difference. What and Now, in the museum before you came on board, um, but, I mean, people quit. There were a bunch of people that quit. What happened? I mean, is that a part of the reason that I think that they're going to let you go? Well, actually, when um, my assistant at the time was Teresa Albrecht, and she was here until the end of June, and she quit. She gave notice at that point in time. And I think part of it was she really wasn't prepared for the season. And she had been through one season before, and it's intense here. It's really intense. She didn't have work campers signed up, so the schedule was pretty much empty. And she was finding it very challenging, and I really didn't, I didn't really get into what it was she was doing um, until she gave notice, and then it became my responsibility. Up to that point, I was working on the 4th of July, and it was the first 4th of July I had ever been at here. So they didn't have any photographs chronicling past 4th of Julys. There, were, there was very little information about what we did in the past, so I, I had no clue. And um, I worked very closely with uh, Peggy Coverdale at the time and working on the 4th of July. And then all of a sudden, Teresa gave notice, and then I, I was responsible for all the rentals and volunteer recruitment and work camper placement. And it became a lot of work. It was very intense. And at that point in time, there was barely enough money to cover my wages, let alone Teresa's. So, I mean, it was, it was actually a good thing that she gave notice because we didn't have any money. Now, has Teresa contacted you at all in ter terms of that time? Have you heard from her? Has she's, she made any contact? She's employed with the... at the Tokeland Hotel. Okay. And she's called me a couple of times just as, uh, as an employee of the hotel. They've actually asked her to contact us for information. Okay. Um, somebody contacted us, wanted to donate a pipe organ. Mm -hmm. And um, I tried to offer it off to Steve at the Glen Acres, and he didn't have room for it. So I contacted um, the Tokeland Hotel via email, and they had Teresa call me and say, yeah, we'll take it. It was like a $400 pipe organ that a woman bought 20 years ago, and she just wanted to get rid of it. To she find a to home take, for yes, it. Yeah. Home. yeah. And uh, I thought, you know, there's, it's not something that fit into our collection, but I thought finding a home for it on the South Beach would be a good thing. Right, right. And uh, so contacted them, and they were thrilled to get it. So, you know, to me, that's kudos for us. I mean, there will be a day when, when this organization needs to go to them, maybe and ask a favor, and uh, they're going to remember what we did, I think. So, but it was, I believe it was valued at $400 or something 20 years ago when the woman bought it. So, you know, expensive thing. It was attractive. So. Well, that's a good, good thing. What what have uh, now Teresa left an e email behind when she left? Um, did she tell you about it? I mean, did you guys have a conversation about her old email address? Do you remember it or? Oh, right. Well, before Teresa came on board, there was a woman named Lynn. Right. And Lynn, I think, came to the organization through the Vista program, and so I believe Vista is the one that set that up. It was, I think, it was Maritime Museum, or it was like M W. Um, I'm not exactly sure, but it was Vista at Comcast.net. And you actually uh, tried to uh, forward that email to director at South Beach Historical, and, and, and we couldn't make that happen. Because we didn't have access yeah. to the and we, domain. And we were unaware of anything else that needed to be forwarded to, to this location. I mean, so, um, but that's apparently where that, the renewal information the re went to that email, which was at that end by then. And I think Jim has an, uh, a real good understanding of how we can avoid that in the future, and that's by going to position, not to individuals. 
and that's pretty much what happened. The thing was that the change was when we went to Google and the fact that it didn't belong to us. The museum actually had an email account through Comcast and we had our own. We could have easily set up something there for Teresa, but she just basically inherited something that was created before her time. Right. So it wasn't and nothing. So, yeah, I mean, it's the same. The email that I inherited when I came on board belonged to TJ and Grace, I believe. So it wasn't, I mean, Rex basically took it over and just continued to use it, and I continued to use it. But it was, what was it, Westport-Maritime at, it was super long. And every time I gave that, that email address to anybody, I had to repeat it three or four times, and it became a real nuisance. And again, I'm sure that Rex probably found the same problems. And... Um, well, it's not a very good advertisable domain. I mean, that's something that you do want to think about when you do domains. So, yeah, I mean, that's... I was just sort of curious. I'm starting to remember the history of just um, what kind of problems you inherited in terms of the IT structure yeah. of the museum. Huge, because we didn't... I mean, we had Outlook, and there were contacts in there, but they, it was more used more like a, a physical address book. It, it was... I believe it was being used for phone numbers. So somebody wanted to know who, you know, TJ's phone number, they'd just look up TJ and then call him on the phone. They weren't really utilizing it as an email program. You know, there was nothing set up, no folders. Um, I mean, since I've been here, I set it up so that we can actually send out press releases to regional media, or I can send out information to local lodging providers or South Beach businesses. I can send out stuff to just our board of directors or to our volunteers. So for like our all our uh, volunteer breakfast uh, meetings, I can just, it only takes me a few minutes to type something up and send it to them. And uh, that wasn't set up when I came here. I how, it seems pretty rudimentary, <laughs> but it was not here. How were meetings set up before you were here? I mean, before you took over? I'm not exactly sure. I, I, it's very possible that, that somebody here made phone calls. I mean, most board, uh, board meetings are held at a certain time on a certain day, and it should be pretty easy. I mean, it's the first Tuesday or the second Tuesday of the month. What was the transition like? I mean, when you, when you first got the job, what, what was the transition? I mean, do you remember the first days? I mean, in terms of how did that transition go? Uh, it went pretty well. Um, you know, when, when Rex was here, um, he's a very outgoing guy, uh, very well-spoken, and I think that um, the difference is, is that when he gave a board report, it was probably three-quarters of the meeting, and, you know, so he pretty much dominated the meeting and, and controlled the conversation and um, shared information with those folks, and I guess I have a different style, and, um, you know... I think it's it's critical that the board get more involved, but I think they need to get more involved at the volunteer level with those committees because that's where they're going to be able to pull knowledgeable people from the community into the organization. And I think in time, that's where they'll pull their pool of, of new board members. And board members can only be on the board for four years. So every four years, there's going to be turnover. And I think it's really important that they, they be aware of that, that they have to constantly be finding um, new energized people to bring on board. And, and right now, there's actually some very energized people. Um, Jeff Pence, tons of energy. But I, I've seen in just the last month or so a change in his attitude. And I don't know if it's because he's reading our bylaws and our articles and learning more, or if it's because of the turmoil from this whole situation that's going on. But I, you can tell he's he's more reluctant to well, throw his hat in the ring. He's we've well we've lost. There's we had two new board members who attended no meetings. These two new board members didn't even make it. Uh, Jim Winans and Rosalie Zimbelman um, were never even officially on the board before they resigned. Oh, just as as a side note here, I did. Um, my mother has been in contact with. Uh, Nancy Hidden Dots in, in this case. Um, she did talk to Jeff, and they were talking about by, bylaws. So I, I'm not sure. I, I guess oh. he did have a, have a problem with the bylaws. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's one of those things, too little, too late. I mean, obviously, in my mind, a lot of things have not been, we have not followed our bylaws. And during that meeting, there was discussion 
um, somebody had suggested that they adopt Robert's Book of Rules. And then Jeff stepped up and said, hey, you don't have to do that. We already, it's in our bylaws. We're already operating under Robert's Book of Rules. But that's the thing is that cart before the horse. I mean, there's, there, you know. So I think Jeff is going to be a real asset. And, and I think that your mom, um, Nancy, was stepped up to be on that committee to look at the bylaws. And Jeff um, also said he'd like to be on that committee, which is really exciting because... I think that's a critical part of the board is that they need to understand the bylaws. At least have one person in the room that understands the bylaws. And um, at the last at the workshop that I attended this um, yesterday, um, that was pretty exciting. There were a lot of people that were were much more animated and much more involved in the process than I've seen before, which is exciting. So. Um, you know, I think down the road, if they can keep this energy up, that's a positive thing, very positive. But I also con am concerned that they might tend to micromanage the organization or the day-to-day -day business, and I don't think that that's healthy at all. I think that, you know, they, they need to understand when they're on those committees, they're functioning as volunteers, and I think it's, it's important that they realize that, but they will make better decisions as board members because they'll be better educated about the process. And I'm not talking about Robert's Book of Rules or the bylaws. I'm talking about what it takes to actually run this place. They're going to learn what it takes to run this place as they sit on those committees and actually delve into the details of what we do here. And whether it be in the collections committee or facility maintenance committee or our financial and budget committee, I mean, that's when people really have to sit down and, and learn what it takes. So I think that that's, that in my mind, that's key. And that's something I have talked to the board about thoroughly since I came here and realized that that's, we need to divvy up the organization, split it into sections and, and focus on how we operate. And um, I think if we do that, we're going to make it. So.